Women Taking the Lead, episode 48. They care so much. They want to make an impact on the lives of others. It's what they want to do. But then uh, that little voice is in their head that's uh, holding them back. They're not putting themselves out there as much as they really should be putting themselves out there. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. This episode is sponsored by Luma Coaching. Want some support to get your dreams off the ground? Go to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello and welcome to Women Taking the Lead podcast. I'm your host, Jody Flynn. I'm excited to be bringing you the male perspective today. This podcast isn't just about women helping women. It's my philosophy that it's going to take both genders working together to promote women to cause change and bring about more appreciation of women as leaders. We can gain a lot of insights from men. So from time to time, I'm going to be interviewing men who work with women around their leadership development. And as our guest today, we have my Mark Mawinney, who is on a mission to help coaches build stronger businesses. He's a lifelong entrepreneur. He achieves this with his daily podcast, Natural Born Coaches, and his programs for coaches, including the six-week intensive Seize Your Niche program. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Tell us a little bit more about you so everyone has a good sense of who they're listening to right now. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for having me on the show, Jody. Go go easy on me. I know I'm a man, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, no, I mean uh, it's interesting because actually the majority of my clients are females. It's probably right now two thirds female and one third male. So I get the female perspective a fair bit where I deal specifically with coaches. But um, yeah, I mean to to you gave a pretty good um, overview. Basically, my background's in real estate, and I've been a coach now uh, for the last couple of years, and um, have really dove into this world. And I have a daily podcast that's uh, really um, lessened the learning curve substantially, where I'm doing so many interviews and talking to so many successful coaches every single day. So that's basically my my niche is uh, and who I focus on is helping specifically coaches because I think coaches can use a lot of help. Uh, there's definitely challenges with the coaching business. And um, I think I've been able to stay on that mission so far. We've been doing well. We've got um, uh, over 200 episodes as, uh, for the podcast as you and I are recording this. So I'm um, uh, looking forward to what the future will bring. That's huge. And congratulations. Yeah, thanks. I need a straight jacket now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, brother. Yeah, I'm sure you've had you. a few of those days. <laughs> I, had, I had a back book that died recently, so I had to get a new one. And uh, as anyone who's experienced a spinning beach wall, a ball of death uh, on a MacBook knows how I was feeling. I was ready to throw it out the window. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I Don't even get me started. I just brought my laptop to the laptop doctor a couple of weeks ago, and it was only gone for a day, but I was climbing the walls. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To kick us off with, Mark, tell us a story about a woman who has impacted you as a leader. Well, I mean, um, I've got it probably a similar um, feelings towards my mother and my grandmother as a lot of your past guests have had. I mean, my mother's um, really someone who's used to taking the lead. She's kind of a no nonsense, um, I'd say type A personality who certainly is not afraid to speak her mind. And uh, my grandmother was more soft spoken, but still a leader nonetheless. But, um, you know, a person, a woman that's had a real big impact on me, uh, obviously I've never met her, but uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, was a huge um, impact. Um, I'm a fan of politics. I'm a poli sci major. And um, I've read and studied a fair bit about her. And I just, I loved her style. I think that she's someone who had probably, you would have never guessed that she would become prime minister. She had all the, the odds stacked against her. And then you look at what what she accomplished and she reached the top of that world which was a man, man's world and still is and um, you know just did incredible with it and became one of the leaders of the world so Margaret Thatcher for me I, I've drawn a lot of um, I guess inspiration from and, and have learned a lot from looking at her life story 
Yeah, she's amazing. And I've watched her biography and I need to read up more on her. But one fact that always jumps out for me is she was the first woman to be prime minister and she was the prime minister the longest yeah. out of any man. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she, well, I, I can't say some of the words what she had, but, you know, she had some some things of steel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do love that quote. I need you to lose your <laughs> iTunes clean rating, so we'll keep it at uh, circular objects of steel. <laughs> <laughs> love it. All right. And Mark, you've worked a lot with women. And what is something that you see that holds them back? Are there any trends or, or common, um, for lack of a better word, things that women deal with that hold them back? Well, I mean, it's not exclusive to women, but I think particularly the, uh, with women, a self-confidence, I think, is a huge issue. And I know everybody struggles with that. Um, but I see it, you know, with coaches that I deal with as well. You have uh, women who um, have such potential. You know that they, they care so much. They want to make an impact on the lives of others. It's what they want to do. But then they've just uh, – that little voice is in their head that's uh, holding them back. They're not putting themselves out there as much as they um, really should be putting themselves out there they're they're holding back and part of what i do is i work to push them through that you know and uh i mean a good example could be helping my clients get on shows like yours you know a lot of coaches are nervous about getting onto a podcast thinking that jody's going to eat them alive on the air and as you know podcasters are uh, very but for the most part very friendly people <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. it's not not the firing squad but there's a lot of um i find you know women that that have issues getting out there and, and you know I think part of it is you have to look at history women have taken a hit from so many years of uh, inequality where um, and there's still a lot of it although it's getting better so I'm not saying that it should be easy but I think a lot of it's also self-imposed limitations because I think women can obviously achieve as much or more than you know the men that are out there if they just take the brakes off and, and don't limit themselves. And is there anything, um, any tools or, or coaching skills that you use in particular when you're approaching the whole issue of self-confidence? I kind of take the approach like the parent that pushes their kid into the into the pool, the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> I have a seven-year-old son, so that sounds horrible. Don't call child services. But a, a lot of ways, that's the best way to do it. You know, um, part of my coaching is I, I'm a huge believer in podcasting, as you are, and the power of it for coaches. So part of what I do is I help the coach I work with get podcasts up and running. And um, a lot of people are holding back. You know, the women, don't, they're afraid to put it out there. They're afraid of uh, attracting haters or critics, or they don't like the sound of their voice. They don't think they're going to be any good at it. And um, I just, you know, I literally <clears throat> do the equivalent of pushing them into the deep end to get in there. And I know that's not what all coaches um, would recommend, but I think sometimes that, that once they get doing it, they, they see how much fun it is and uh, it's not nearly as scary as they thought, but you don't know that until you get into the pool and actually do it. So I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, telling them that, hey, you can do it, remind them that they that they could do it, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm nothing special and I've been able to do hundreds of podcast episodes, so they can certainly do it. And then once they get doing it, they're, they're addicted to podcasting or the other business building things I help them with. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I don't know that I would describe it as pushing someone into the <laughs> deep end, though I do like that image. Um, the fear and worry can't exist while you're taking action, mm. right? Like when you sit and think and think about it, fear and worry grow. Right. And they start eating away at you. So I like your approach. And I agree that that is an approach I take with my clients as well is you have to get in action. You have to try it. Confidence comes after you take the action. You know, it doesn't come from sitting and planning and planning and planning and researching and yeah. researching. You have to get out there and you've got to do something. Yeah. So I love yeah, that. There's an awesome quote, um, Ambrose uh, Redmoon, I believe it was, that courage is not the absence of fear, but the awareness that something else is more important. So everybody feels fear. I mean, Margaret Thatcher, I'm sure, felt fear. You know, um, all the other greats, you know, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, all of them have felt fear, but they just pushed ahead anyways. And the worst thing that 
that I see coaches doing, I shouldn't say the worst thing. There's uh, cause I know you were trained, I believe in IPAC and I think IPAC a great certification and there's some great programs out there, but I think people can get into, especially coaches into this endless certification where they got years and years of doing virtual training and, and trying to learn more and more. And then pretty soon they lose that motivation because they're not actually working with people or, you know, building mm-hmm. a business. So I think you have to combine it while you're learning. You also have to be building a business because that action is going to uh, help the fear dissipate. Yep. There's always a good excuse why you can't take the action. Mm. Perfect. And Mark, what have you learned from the women you've mentored? Um, well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's a good start. Keep going. <laughs> well, the interesting thing, like I mentioned, is uh, I work uh, with more women than men. And that's probably part of it, just being in the coaching world, you know, it tends to skew that way. But I, what I've found is that women are generally better listeners than men. And, um, you know, that's, a I know, a gross generalization. But I think all in all, that's probably the case. And uh, when I became a coach, I kind of walked into it thinking of coaching as being, okay, you're going to tell the client, do this, this, and this, you know, do A, B, C, D, you'll get what you want to get. And as you know, coaching isn't that way at all. You have to listen to the client, you have to hear what they're saying, and then you have to help pull it out of them. You're working as a team, but it, it's not this, um, you're using the carrot more than the stick in some cases. So I've found that the women uh, have shown me that, that it helps to listen. So if I'm um, same way as with my podcast, I'm talking talking less than, than the guest, you know, I'm listening more, but when I'm in my coaching sessions, I'm listening a majority of the time as opposed to talking. And, um, I think that's something that I've probably learned a lot from the women that I've worked with. Mm, yeah, there is a power in listening. It's just incredible. And I, I lead a workshop series for, um, folks who work in an office to learn coaching skills that they can take back to use, right? They're not, they're not getting certified to be coaches. They're not looking to hang out a shingle. They just want to learn coaching skills that they can use on the job to benefit their organizations. And we talk about listening a lot, every, like it's an eight day series and we talk about it every day. And there's one day, I think we talk about listening for six of the eight hours Mm. that we're together because it is so powerful. Um, and they, they're just, they get blown away by how good they get at coaching and how how the the results that the other people participating get when they're peer coaching each other just by listening and being in tune with what where the other person is coming mm. from. So that's fantastic, Mark. And what changes do you see are necessary for more women to step up as leaders? Well, again, I I think it's probably the case for men as well, but particularly with women, um, again, I don't want to, I don't want to risk your clean ratings. So I got (laughs) to, I I interviewed uh, Larry Wingett on my podcast recently, and I'm not sure if you've heard any of his stuff. Um, He's written uh, his latest books called Grow a Pair, and it's him holding two big watermelons on the cover. And uh, some of his other books are, you know, um, pretty, um, the titles are interesting. So I I think, you know, women and men too, but they really need to um, grow a pair, so to speak. And and, um, if you want something, you have to be prepared to go out there and get it and be aggressive. And it's difficult for women because um, if a man does it, a lot of times it's seen as being strong and as being a leader. But then if a woman does it, like, say, Margaret Thatcher that we talked about, then it's viewed um, differently, you know, with the word that rhymes like uh, itchy. Uh, mm-hmm. So unfortunately, that's the, the double standard there, and it makes it difficult for women. But I, I think women just have to um, – in that regard, act more like men in a lot of cases and, uh, and not worry about what other people think. I mean, there's an awesome book, um, that a female wrote Chin, Chin Ning Chu called thick face, black heart. And that's one of my favorite books. And, uh, that book is something I'd recommend that all your listeners check out. It's not really well known here in the Western world. It's, um, in the Asian world, it's more, but it's, it's basically, um, I say a combination of, uh, think and grow rich combined with the art of war and, uh, excellent books. So thick face, black heart. 
Wow. And what what would you say were some of the um, salient points that you got from that book? Oh, there's so many. Um, I've, uh, you know, I just found out about the book probably, I don't know, a little over a year ago. And the first year I had it, I read it cover to cover three times and uh, went through a couple highlighters, you know, going through it. Basically, Thick Face, Black Heart, um, helps people get past the problem we have in society nowadays where we're so afraid of offending people and going after what we want because we're afraid that's going to make us look callous or, you know, we're going to look greedy or whatever, you know, negative word could be put in there. And what Thick Face Black Heart is all about is it's basically getting you past those things that are holding you back. So you're not afraid to go out there and go after um, basically what you want. You're not letting yourself... You're not letting yourself be influenced by the opinion um, of others. All you care about is your own opinion of yourself. You know, you don't really care um, about what others think. So Thick Faces, uh, she describes as a shield to protect uh, your self-esteem from the bad opinion of others, basically. So that's the Thick Face um, portion of it. And she gives a whole bunch of awesome examples. And then Black Hearts, basically that um, process of taking action without regard to how the consequences are going to affect other people. So she, she said in the book of black hearts, uh, ruthless, but not evil. So <laughs> yeah. I sound horrible saying this book, people are going to think, Oh my gosh, you know, he's, he's recommending this book, but I, I do think we need to be more that way. I think people are so afraid nowadays of going after what they want, that they've become wimps in a lot of ways. And that's your show is, you know, perfect antidote to that women taking the lead you're taking the lead you're going after what you want mm, thank you for clarifying the title mark because at first i was very curious about that i, I kind of got the thick face but the black heart was hard for me <laughs> to wrap my mind around but i can't even tell you how many stupid situations i got myself into and stayed in because i didn't want to disappoint people and i didn't want to let them down and it was completely the wrong thing for me yeah and i just stayed in it. And like my mindset at that time was um, one of a martyr, but not doing, not making sacrifice for any greater good other than not disappointing people. Right. It wasn't for any other benefit. Um, so it really wasn't martyrdom at all, but that was the feeling of just like, okay, I'm getting nothing out of this. Mm but I don't want people to dislike me. Yeah, I had about probably 10 years, a decade of when I was in real estate. Of course, when you're in real estate, you, you're you conscious of losing clients to one of the other 300 agents in your marketplace. Uh, so you try to please everybody. You know, you just think you have to, everybody has to like you. You don't want to lose any potential clients. So I had many years where I was um, a people pleaser and, and I took pride in the fact of, oh, everybody, for the amount of deals I was doing, you know what, people like me. And then I went through a business closure years ago where I had about 100 employees and uh, the whole uh, thing crumbled. And then suddenly I was public enemy number one to a lot of people and I was getting kicked around a lot. And that really, um, it was great in a lot of ways. It thickened my skin and and it got me past that need to have everyone like me because suddenly uh, not everybody liked me. And uh, that that was about the silver lining that came from that. And I wouldn't be talking to you here today and, and be coaching had I still been in that business. But um <laughs> Uh, yeah. Anyone who's gone through a business closure knows that you're going to attract uh, some haters and some critics going through that. Um, but there's a that's a positive. The positive side to it is is I really don't um, I don't care what people think as much now. Just going through that, I care more about myself, my son, and then uh, the people I'm working with. You know, my clients, and then I just uh, I don't hold back. I don't uh, operate out of a position of fear of what will people think. And you know, as you're connected with me on social media, so you know that I'm a pretty shameless self promoter, and I'm not not afraid to get out there. But you have to be that way in business, right? Yeah, you really do. You really have to have that thick skin um, to get out there and be visible and let it be known because we, we both each have our own missions that are very similar. Like you're trying to pave the way and empower coaches the same way I'm trying to pave the way and empower women. Um, and there's a lot of overlap in that. But in order to do that, we have to be very visible. And that attracts all the people that we want in our communities and then some, mm. right? And then it attracts people who just want to tear other people down and make them feel bad. And, and you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, I guess, vent their own unhappiness. And, and that can happen in a public forum, for sure. Um, we've all seen trolls 
on on the blogosphere and <laughs> and, and in Facebook. And I'm gonna um, paraphrase it because I don't know it word for word. But one of my favorite quotes comes from Bill Cosby, who says, "I don't know the secret to success, mm. but the secret to failure is trying to please everybody." Yes. And I know Bill Cosby may not be the most popular guy um, amongst your fans right now, but I think that's a great quote. Um, <laughs> the, yes, the, uh, it is still true. <laughs> I actually have saved true. in the camera roll my iPhone for special occasions. Oh. I've got that. Uh, you've probably seen the meme from The Great Gatsby with the remake with Leonardo DiCaprio. You know, cheers to all my haters. There, there's more where that came from. He's given the toast. Um, right. Yeah, I've got that ready to roll when uh, when I attract some of the nut bars that, that uh, some come, sometimes come at me. So uh, you just have to take that approach. You can't worry about them. You, you actually can use haters and critics to motivate you if you can get your head wrapped around that concept. So I should, I actually owe a lot to my haters because they're what gets me out of bed bright and early every morning. And um, when something, when I get attacked, I tend to go into overdrive and it, it, oh, it motivates me. It puts me the other way instead of getting off my game or depressed or wallowing in self-pity. So I should probably thank them for anything that I've achieved. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is so certainly a motivator. One of my coping skills too, is to just send them a blessing. I'm like, clearly you are a person You're a better pain. person than me. <laughs> <laughs> but it just helps me like yeah. to just look, take it from the perspective of here's a person who's just in pain and God, you know, God be with you, but I'm not going to lie, Mark. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, you think so? <laughs> you know, and it does, and it is motivating. <laughs> it's not that I'm like, if I get trolled, I'm I'm getting into fights all day long, and I right. I don't want to waste my energy when it could be put towards the positive stuff. Um, I have no problem blocking people, but you know, there's that saying. I think it was George Bernard Shaw said, "Never wrestle with a pig. You, you get dirty, and the pig likes it." Um, so mm -hmm. there's no sense getting into uh, the mud. I can get into the mud if needed, but I don't let it take me away from the business stuff I have to be doing. Like I, uh, some people get into these. Uh, protracted fights on social media and it goes on for days the drama and all that stuff there's a reason oh, that there's a block yeah. button i just don't buy it if there's somebody harassing me okay i'll block you i don't need to deal with it and then i keep doing my thing uh, so i think there's a little bit of a balance but you, you've got some great self-control if you're able to bless them <laughs> yeah yeah you know i li i like your approach you know shut them down and move on just walk away from it. And if it motivates you, it motivates you, but there's no need to engage in the drama. And we've been dropping some really good quotes here, Mark, but I want you to share with us a particular quote in a mantra and why it has meaning for you. Well, the one I love, I think is perfect for this show. And, and we've been talking about some similar women like uh, Margaret Thatcher, but it's from Ayn Rand. You know, Atlas Shrugged is probably one of my favorite books. And she has a great quote. Uh, the question isn't who's going to let me, it's who's going to stop me. And that's one that uh, has always stuck with me. And I love it. I love that one too. Gosh. And I'm, you know, I'm, I can't even say I'm in the middle of Atlas Shrug. I'm probably like, 20% of the way through the audio book. And I think I've clocked like five hours yeah. so far. It's a big book, well, but I had incredible. A, I had a number of false starts over the years because of course entrepreneurs would say, you got to read Atlas Shrugged. And then I would look at this huge monster. I'd have to like get a backhoe to carry the thing, uh, you know, a thousand <laughs> pages. And I yeah. uh, reading it, I just, I couldn't, it, I, I didn't have enough time to read, to get into it, you know, to, to far enough. And um, it was the audio book version for for me that that last summer I took I think it was 65 hours on audible and it was just yeah. like it was like eating an elephant you know the easiest way is one bite at a time it was an hour or two a day you know and then I finally finished it and it was exhausting <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm like I'm gonna finish a soccer one way or another um some people could rent the movie I'd warn you that the movie's not as good they really uh, changed a lot of things that they shouldn't have I don't think they really understood the whole meaning of it so I the movies are not an accurate uh, depiction of the book yeah, you can't take a book that size and turn it into a movie. So I'm I'm going to continue to go through the audiobook as long as you tell me it was worth it getting to the end. Well, you could turn it the speed to 1.5. I don't know if I'd go to 2 or whatever, but that could speed it up a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I I don't know if there's anything I can ruin for you anyways. It's not like a book with a you know big spoiler or whatever. But I will say there's some interesting things definitely uh, uh, towards the end of the book. So keep at it. Okay. I'm in. I'm going to continue. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mark, what's a practice that you have that you believe makes you a better leader? Uh, well, one thing that really helps me, I'm really big on journaling. 
Um, I've been doing it now for probably five or six years. Uh, so I journal. There's been very few days I've actually missed. Uh, so I'm a big fan of journaling. You know, Jim Rohn's got an awesome um, book, and there's an audio for how to journal, and uh, that's an excellent one. I think it's on YouTube if anyone wants to check it out. It's somewhere around an hour. And um, I think you should definitely be journaling. I mean, that's how I've come up with um, some of my best ideas. Uh, it's a way to unload on the paper, to think uh, some problems out. On, on creatively and come up with uh, some solutions you hadn't thought of. So I'm a huge fan of journaling. Awesome. All right, Mark. And let us know how we can connect with you. Uh, best spot is naturalborncoaches.com. Awesome. And you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com, or you can use the shortened URL, which is womentl.com. And Mark, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. We are all better for having met you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jody. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Were you inspired to take some action today, but maybe don't know where to start? Or maybe you have so many great ideas you can't decide where to focus your attention. Don't let stress or overwhelm stop you from having the career, the business, or the life you want to live. Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching or use the short link womentl.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. So here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.